Welcome. It's been a year almost to the day since a man invoking the vocabulary of law and order was elected president. A great deal has changed since election day 2016, except the unacceptable stats. The unconscionable fact that 6.1 million previously incarcerated American citizens were denied the right to vote yesterday. The unconscionable fact that the number of Americans in jail or prison in the AKA land of the free remains the highest in the world with 2.2 million people in the nation's prisons and jails. A few months ago, I ran into a professor whose scholarship is devoted to the social history of slavery and the carceral state. And in the course of our conversation, I shared my own experience of someone I love being caught up in the criminal justice system delayed court dates on the level of years, traumatic jail time with privatized essentials, including phone plans you have to have a credit card you might not possess in order to simply reach your loved ones and friends, and the additional post-release indignities of surveillance by an insidiously confining, unnecessarily humbling, and frequently faulty, and therefore panic-inducing, trauma-perpetuating ankle bracelet to which the professor said, you've known someone in prison? Of course you've known someone in prison if you're alive and American. Last spring, I was deeply saddened to have to cancel due to illness um, an event the Poetry Room had planned on this very subject, which would had included one of tonight's guests, Jackie Wang, and Neil Barsky of the Marshall Project. So when I received a compelling email this spring from poet, activist, editor, and co-founder of Undocu Poets, the Undocu Poets campaign, Christopher Soto, uh, mentioning his sincere interest in the possibility of organizing an event on mass incarceration, I jumped at the chance. Christopher has worked diligently with Jackie Wang to put together a remarkable event tonight. It's such an honor to be in the presence of four poets, activists, scholars, and educators who have shown a path or paths forward through writing itself and all that that vital verb includes. I still believe that creative writing and the magnitudes of the human imagination, creative structures such as writing collectives and advocacy nonprofits like the Sentencing Project, the Innocence Project, and the Marshall Project that work to synthesize experience and information and give voice to those most affected by the current unacceptable conditions of our criminal justice system, as well as vigorous and generative scholarship that helps us to reconceptualize institutions and challenge in institutionalized violence, unsettle seemingly unshakable infrastructures, and denaturalize systems of control and confinement, that all of these writerly to me actions can and will compel change. As Tracy Morris stated emphatically right here a week ago in this room, no one is due cells. No one is due cells. Please welcome tonight's introducer and prime mover, Christopher Soto, who will contribute his own thinking on the subject and introduce our esteemed guest tonight. Christopher. All right. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to be here. Uh, laptop open. Go notes. Um, OK, so uh, quick uh, thanks to Christina, Mary, Woodbury Poetry Room, everyone for providing the space. Um, also, I wanted to bring the names of Chelsea Manning and Michelle Jones uh, into the room before we begin. As folks know, Harvard um, had denied admittance to Chelsea Manning and Michelle Jones for fellowships in this institution um, because of their relationship to the prison industrial complex. So I want to make sure that um, both trans women and uh, black women who have survived uh, mass incarceration, uh, their spirits and their names are with us today. Uh, I'm going to be reading from an essay called Poetry in the Age of Mass Incarceration, Challenging the Dichotomy of Innocence versus Criminality. Um, I'll give the cliff notes, I'll do sh the short version. Um, yeah, and then we'll have three other readers presenters who will also do another like 10 to 15 minutes a piece, and then we'll do about 20 minutes of Q&A talking about 
uh, what constitutes as violence, innocence, criminality, humanity, animality, um, all that kind of shit. Does that sound good? Yeah. Good. Okay. Let's see. It's an academic y kind of essay, so I'll try to not sound like that. Um, mass incarceration within the United States. Uh, is often described as a period from the early 1970s when Pre Pre President Richard Nixon began the war on drugs and continuing on to the present day. Some scholars, such as Elizabeth Hinton, who teaches here, would likely argue that the frameworks of mass incarceration could be traced further back to John F. Kennedy, who characterized black youth as being, need in, as being in need of repair rather than justice. This statement also depicts how the development of mass incarceration has been a byproduct of bipartisan legislation, AKA get your white liberals in check. We could get lively here, you could, you could chuckle. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, according to Michelle Alexander in 1972, fewer than 350 people were being held in prisons and jailed nationwide compared with more than 2 million people today. According, it's there, I'm gonna do tangents, I'm also Aquarius. Paul Mariah, <laughs> it's, it's true, it's true. Um, Paul Mariah, uh, in his book, uh, Persona Non Grata, dedicates uh, that chat book to, uh, to approximately 300,000 uh, incarcerated people at that time. And that epigraph uh, or that dedication, it just feels so heavy to him. And looking back from our time, from, from where exi we're existing right now, I'm like, holy shit, a lot has, a lot has changed. And, a short amount of time. Um, according to Angela Davis, the US population in general is less than 5% of the world's total, where more than 20% of the world's combined prison population can be claimed by the United States. This number of people incarcerated in American prisons does not even include individuals currently monitored on probation and parole. By the end of 2014, approximately 4,708,100 people, 4,708,100 people, 4,708,100 people in the United States were being monitored on probation or parole and they have families. With the continuing influx of prisoners and non-incarcerated civilians affected by systems of surveillance and criminalization, there has been no shortage of literary writing that responds to the age of mass incarceration. The prison canon or literature produced uh, responding to systems of incarceration continues to grow. This essay examines poetry that reimagines mass incarceration by challenging the dichotomy of innocence versus criminality, the dichotomy that upholds the US prison system. And it gestures towards a more capacious definition of what constitutes as prison literature. Thus, the main goal of the poet in the age of mass incarceration is often to imagine a world beyond retributive violence by the state. The poet is able to na name state violence as violence when it otherwise goes unseen. The poems below use several techniques to, compli to complicate the dichotomy of innocence versus crim criminality and reimagine or resist punitive systems. From narrating experiences in prison to observing, ob observing incarceration to refusing police violence. Um, so those are the three main lenses. Um, from poets producing in the age of mass incarceration that I'm going to outline very briefly um, and probably skip through some sections as I get bored with myself. Um, so I have nowhere to write. Um, mental notes. Um, narrating experiences in prison and jail. One, cool, not cool, oof. Uh, two, ob <laughs> two, observing incarceration and three, refusing police violence. That subtle tapping you hear as pages passing. Okay. Um, quick check, how y'all feeling? Good. Okay. You find the love of your life in the room yet? You could be down for activism and cruise too. That's queer life. Okay. I usually do like um, less formal poetry readings than that more formal like academic work. So um, it's very interesting though I love it. Okay, 
onward for an Aquarius. Also an Aquarius. Two Aquariuses. Oh, hey, we're going to have fun tonight. <laughs> okay. Um, narrating experiences in prison and jail. So this is one lens. A bulk of poetry produced by prisoners in the age of mass incarceration could be found in anthologies specifically dedicated to prison writing. Though there are a handful of collections written by prisoners or formerly incarcerated poets that have become well regarded within various literary canons. Some of the poets who have written these collections include Jimmy Santiago Baca, Paul Mariah, Etheridge Knight, and Reginald Dwayne Betts. It, is seem, uh, it seems apt to focus on the work of Etheridge Knight who was in prison from 1960 to 1968, just shortly before the age of mass incarceration, and whose work about prisons was published throughout the st uh, start of the age of mass incarceration. Also focus will be brought to the work of Reginald Dwayne Betts, uh, who was incarcerated, incarcerated from 96 to 2005, and who's become one of the 21st century's leading poets writing about the US prison system. When considering narrative poems of, by formerly incarcerated people, there's often a double, double consciousness of, which, uh, of which Du Bois says is a sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of another. The prison operate, operates as a geographical location that separates the prisoner from the free world and creates a purgatory or non-life for the incarcerated person through which the self is examined. The narratives and poetry by incarcerated people often examine the space between themselves and the outside world, serving as a bridge between the two populations through narrative poets in the age of mass incarceration. I don't agree with that statement anymore. Narratives about, uh, 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 I don't agree with that. Etheridge Knight, the idea of ancestry. Taped to the wall, of, so this is Etheridge Knight, the idea of ancestry. Cool. Y'all know him? Okay. Uh, taped to the wall of my cell are 47 pictures, 47 black faces, my father, mother, grandmothers, one dead, grandfathers, both dead, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, cousins, first and second, nieces and nephews. They stare across the space at me sprawling on my bunk. I know their dark eyes, they know mine. I know their st style, they know mine. I am all of them, they are all of me. They are farmers, I am a thief, I am me. The, they are the. This poem operates as a bridge to the nuclear family unit in the non-incarcerated world from incarcerated person exists in neither of those spaces exclusively, but was created out of those spaces communicating the divide. Apparent is, is the estrangement from generations of black kin and a desire to see the self as part of the family. Yet there is this struggle when naming the difference between them. They stare across the space at me as if looking at the narrator's otherness and naming his incarceration, the family unit is not located in the prison cell and their staring is merely an illusion of photographs from the non-incarcerated world to the incarcerated world. Interaction with the family in those poems is merely an internal dialogue, not reciprocated. Here, the isolation of the prison becomes direly apparent. The narrator exists as a single individual extracted from the collectivity, uh, collectivity of the family unit and contemplating the movement of time. Knight writes, grandmother, one dead, grandfather, both dead, grandfathers, both dead, and the passing of time becomes a consideration of the poem. How long ago was the photograph taken and were the grandparents still alive before the narrator entered prison? How long has the narrator been in prison? Did he miss the funeral of his grandparents? Contemplations of space and time are present within many of the poems produced in the age of mass incarceration. And the prison controls the most both, these, both of these concepts for the prisoner. Space is dictated by the boundaries of the cell or the prison walls contrasting the idea of the outside world, time in prison is often exist, exist as a waiting period or non-life until the time outside of prison, skipping down. Okay. Um, the, full, the full essay I can email to you, the cliff notes um, is available on Poetry Foundation. You're getting the cliff notes of the cliff notes. Two of three. 
observations of incarceration. Expanding who is considered within the poetry prison canon beyond only incarcerated or formerly incarcerated people allows space for the impact of incarceration on family and community members who have been separated from incarcerated people and have been financially or emotionally uh, impacted because of the separation to come uh, alive too, or to come into the space also. Uh, it seems appropriate to also discuss these poems about incarceration from poets who have not been incarcerated. Uh, some of those folks are writing about prison histories, others are writing about their experiences teaching in prisons and jails, and some poets are reflecting on having incarcerated family members. The work of those poets often serve as testimony towards the notion of the state as a purveyor of violence and not always innocent. Poets who have written about prison history include Lucy Brock Broido and Laylee Long Soldier. The approach of writing about prison history serves to readdress the memory of the American uh, to readdress the mem memory around the American prison system. To recall moments of prison history is to refuse the obliteration of narratives regarding state violence. In the poem 38 by Laylee Long Soldier, the poet recalls the imprisonment of a thousand Dakota people and the legal execution of 38 Dakota people after the Sui uprising. This, is, this poem is necessary when considered in relationship to the current imprisonment of Dakota protesters who are fighting for water and against the creation of the Dakota Access Pipeline. This essay was written last year, but it's still pertinent. Lele Long Soldier writes, as a result and without other option, but to continue to starve, Dakota people retaliated. Dakota warriors organized, struck out, and killed settlers and traders. This revolt is called the Sui Uprising. Eventually, the US Cavalry came to Minnesota to confront the uprising. Over 1,000 Dakota people were sent to prison. This poem allows the reader to connect to past histories of native resistance and incarceration um, and incarceration occur occurring in the present day. I'll skip on. Poets teaching about um, or visiting incarcerated individuals can also be noted throughout the poetry prison canon. The poetic approach approaches towards addressing uh, visits to prison and jails varies. For example, Idra Novi has, embodied, uh, has embodiment poems that were written after time spent teaching in the Bard Prison Initiative, and many of these poems are not confined to the geography of the prison itself. In her poem, House Arrests, Novi writes, when punishment became a picture frame, the state gave our mother a glittering one and some picture wire so she could hover properly on the wall. Neighbors asked if this stillness had always been in her before. If we poured our milk differently over our cereal with our mother always, fi with our mother always fixed on the ceiling and listening. This embodiment poem does not speak to the prison itself, uh, but of house arrest afterwards and of the emotional disconnect between a mother and child after prison. Meanwhile, C.D. Wright does not write embodiment poems, but rather first person, observational, almost journalistic, poetry about her time spent while visiting Louisiana prisons. Okay, we'll skip a little. Mm. And then we'll get to the last. There was kind of three bullet points within this. There was like two A, B, and then we'll get to three C. So I kind of tricked you in this section. Poets who have written about having incarcerated family members include Natalie Diaz and Ocean Young. In her first poetry collection, When My Brother Was an Aztec, Diaz describes her brother's, brother's heroin addiction. Diaz wrote about incarceration of her brother, saying, it's not the first time, it's not even the second. My brother is arrested again and again. Again, our dad, our Sisyphus, places his, pushes his blue heart up to the station. This poem shows the emotional and physical and financial and gendered labor that is extracted from family members who seek to support their incarcerated relatives. The crimes of the brother in the poem are addressed. The narrator does not attempt to depict the brother as innocent. Rather, the poem is centered around the wariness that the actions uh, of her brother have caused on the fam imprisonment have caused on the family. 
then more literary analysis. Can we go to part three? Okay. I think this is doing a decent job of contextualizing the vast amount of literature that's produced responding to the age of mass incarceration. Thumbs up? Thanks for the affirmation. <laughs> I really, yeah, that's how I date too. Um, set myself up. Poems about police violence. This is the last section. Poems about police violence should be addressed within uh, the poetry prison canon because it is police who observe, who serve as intermediaries between the between US, between civilians and the court. The police uphold the law of the court to move the bodies of civilians from non-incarcerated world to the to incarceration, a, aka kidnapping. Police also murder civilians and take their bodies out of this world compete completely, which is an extended conversation about the relationship between mass incarceration and necropolitics. And in a sense, the police are living in a liminal space. Um, okay. We'll go past that. The poets who I think um, should be spoken about less formally um, when considering responses to police violence uh, the first one that comes to my head is A, or, or sorry, apologies, I, Riot Act. Um, I think about June Jordan, uh, poem about police violence. I think about Audre Lorde, Power. Um, so I want to bring those poets into the room also. Um, great, I'll do a conclusion. By narrating experiences with police and incarceration, poets are challenging the dichotomy of innocence versus criminality. In prison, resources are scarce, and poetry and its prolific nature can be one of the easiest forms of self-expression to diminish the divide between incarcerated and non-incarcerated worlds. Poets can ensure the state is not presumed to be innocent and that the prisoner is not merely depicted as criminal. OK, recap, and then we'll move on to the other uh, lecture people. OK. Great. Mm. OK, does anyone remember what the three things we talked about were? Observing incarceration. Oh my god, you're so good. OK, I think there was one more. Voila, I did my job. <laughs> <laughs> and next up. I'll do. I'll just do uh, an emotional uh, intro Aquarius introduction for Dr. Joshua Bennett, who has a shit ton of accolades and publications um, that you could Google. Is also the author of the Sobbing School, which is in his hands. Um, but uh, and started the June Jordan uh, Fellowship at Columbia University. Doctorates from uh, Princeton, now at Harvard, now I'm getting into all the boring shit. Um, so jo Dr. Joshua Bennett has, um, been an amazing support of so many literary and activist communities and has provided me space to like learn and grow as a thinker, poet, scholar, engage with like the community, um, and has like redistributed like hella resources to like brown and black folks, um, in New York, in the Harlem, Harlem area. And so it's a pleasure. Uh, to be sharing space with you. Please welcome Dr. Joshua Bennett. The best intro ever. How are y'all doing? Yeah, okay. I think I'm just gonna read some poems, if that's all right. All right. I rarely get to be in this mode anymore. So this is uh, from a new collection that I'm working on called Ode, O-W-E-D, because uh, they're poems of reparation um, and debt. So this first poem is for my older brother, who was incarcerated when I was very young, because uh, his friends robbed a corner store, and uh, he was the lookout. So for me, this work, a lot of my stake in it has to do with my sort of direct blood ties, but also just my sense that it's not ethical for human beings to be in cages. So this first poem is Elegy for Prison. Without fail, at least one student replies, but what will we do with all the murderers? 
And the answer hasn't changed since I first felt cuffs, read Etheridge or Duane, heard iron doors too heavy to dent with any human pair of hands thud shut. We cannot speak as if the killers are not already among us mowing the lawn, getting promotions, trying on their fresh winter coats. As if my older brother were perpetually dressed for the role of corner store stick up boy, eyes preordained for the work of making out unmarked cop cars from a distance, calm as Jimmy Carter while a handgun rests below the pitch navy Averex jeans mama got him to celebrate high honor roll. A's across the board, even in environmental science where he struggled early on. I get the argument. Close the jails and there he goes again. Classic Sean, up at 7 a.m., mapping out ever more intricate ways to rob a bodega. Sean with the shotgun, Sean with the bulletproof skin, Sean with the stains on his blood. No one comes right out and says he was born with them. No one calls him a thug or an emptiness. Nothing so gauche as all that. Most of those assembled in the lecture hall opt instead for terms like practical or natural selection, say, let's be realistic here. It's really a matter of public order. I mean, we have to keep them all somewhere, right? If someone killed my mother, money wouldn't help at all. I would want to take away the one thing they can't ever take back, and that's time. I'm gonna read a poem about grandmas now. Because part of what I wanna articulate in this book is I think often when we talk about mass incarceration, we don't talk about it as a continuum, right? So not just the prison, uh, the police state, its tentacles reach into our homes. Um, and so part of what I'm trying to think about are what are sort of black aesthetic responses to that. Um, and for whatever reason, part of what I came up with is that uh, we preserve everything we love. So this is about all the grandmas that put plastic on their couches. And this is our ode, O-W-E-D, to the plastic on your grandma's couch. Which could almost be said to glisten or glow like the weaponry in heaven. Frictionless, as if slickened with some Pentecostal auntie's last bottle of anointing oil, an ark of no covenant one might easily name, apart from the promise to preserve all small and distinctly mortal forms of loveliness that any elder African-American woman makes the day they see 60. Consider the garden of collard greens and heirloom tomatoes only, her long single braid streaked with gray like a gathering of weather, the child popped in church for not sitting still, how even that, they say, can become an omen if you aren't careful, if you don't act like you know all Newton's laws don't apply to us the same exactly, ain't no equal and opposite reaction to the everyday brawl blackness in America is. No body so beloved, it cannot be destroyed. So we hold onto what we cannot hold, adorn it in Vaseline or gold or polyurethane wrapping. Call it ours and don't mean owned. Call it just like new mean alive. So I've, uh, I've only called the police one time in my life, and it was, uh, it was on my, my dad, because we got in a fist fight. And uh, I never really talk about this. I, I wanted the police, I was about 14 years old, and uh, the only thing I knew about police was that they killed people. Um, and I, at that moment, I, I wanted my father gone, and so I called the cops. Um, and they came, and, and they left. It was a very strange moment. We could talk more about that during Q&A. Um, me and my dad are cool now. He's a, he's a good dude. He's working on some stuff. So this is Elegy for the Police State. What I imagined first were pruning hooks. Something biblical, agrarian, a new use for metal once good for little more than tearing the air from a docile body. Then a gesture towards the speculative, improbable overdue machines, teleportation pads and 12-speed hover bikes, lightsabers that can't kill but make you feel warm and amorphous upon contact, like good ramen or when you find someone else's money on the floor. The exercise grew unwieldy, 
So I gave my energies over to more practical matters. Who to call when you get robbed or hit with a bat? Who else to feed the dogs of entropy and personal choice? The price we pay to live decent, which is to say, far from the stench of the dead and the dying interlocked, unintelligible with all that gold in their mouths. Here's a story. Once, freshly cast by my old man to the hotel room wall, throat now full of my own unoriginal blood, I knew I needed my father dead, assumed the quickest route would be to call the law. Twelve years old, and already this kind of contract killer, I took my cue from scenes at school, black wands buzzing before each child, marking us ready for class or cuffs, no middle ground to be found, really, what I have since heard called a pipeline, more of a smooth continuum from hold to hold, everywhere batons and threats of premature interment, everywhere taupe walls like the ones in jail, and someone's grandbaby pummeled raw. A couple more. So I think part of what you do when you grow up that way is you start to imagine other worlds and other ways that it could be. Um, and I think since ta Coates' article on reparations, I've started to actually think what reparations could look like. Um, so this poem is kind of a gesture towards that, and it's part of a series called Reparation. One of the poems is about my therapist. I'm not reading that one. This is just, <laughs> when I think of reparations, what I dream of. <clears throat> Reparation. 40 acres in a jewel-encrusted orchid crown for each and every living baby girl growing up the way we did, the way we do, unbridled, unburied though we stay pursued by the U.S. school-to-prison state's laser-like vision, bi-weekly standing ovations, Harriet Tubman resuscitated with a sledgehammer slung over her left shoulder, eyes ablaze and dead set on the private sector, the price of four-year tuition, four-year fascist presidents, any and all forms of predatory opulence. Scholarships. Scholars that love us enough to break this language lengthwise, filled as it is with the bones of our fallen, monuments to the fallen, a grave site for the illustrious Negro dead, like Zora Neale Hurston said, illustrious meaning you were black and full of adoration or vexed, which is just another way of saying you wanted to survive, the world said die, and you refused its refusal. Another approach to the general sentiment that blackness is beautiful, with no reference to their everyday negation of our essential human splendor, an apology on the Senate floor for the trade, the plunder of our names, unremarked graves, a hand in the hair, boot to the throat, guns in the schools, and the guns are the books, the stares of the second grade teacher calling your son a distraction, your daughter's braids illegal, your building a blight on the neighborhood, the good you do and dream of, never quite good enough to merit the bull's eyes removal. A ship to wherever we point on a map of the measurable universe. Dare call harbor, sanctum, ground where the children can play and come home whole. Mm, thank you. <laughs> Y'all are so live. Okay. I got like two more. So I went to a, a private school for, well, I've gone to private school for a long time. The first private school I went to, though, was a black private school, an all-black private school called the Modern School. Um, and you cannot find the Modern School anymore now because it's a parking lot, um, which I write about in the first book. I have a poem called Black History Abridged in the Sobbing School, and it's literally like three lines. And it's basically, I went to this school, and then an elderly white woman purchased it, and now it's a parking lot. Um, which for me is like a certain vision of, of like black history, right? That even from the very beginning, school in the United States is a, a technology of confinement for black children, right? Um, one of my best friends, Dr. Jarvis Givens, he's here in the education school, and he gave a lecture last week and he just showed uh, textbooks from the late 19th century that were required for black children to learn from. Um, and it was mandated in the beginning of the book that at least I think like 90% of the teaching time had to be dedicated to the glories of the, the white race and the Indo-European strand in particular, right? And so uh, part of the lecture was about how black teachers uh, 
engaged in these what he called fugitive practices. So when superintendents or vice principals would come by, they would hold up that book and pretend to be teaching from it. And then behind it, they would have Carter G. Woodson's textbooks about how these children were beautiful um, and about black educational heritage, right, and everything they'd come from and survived. So um, long before I was ever um, in an elite, predominantly white institution that told me I was essentially valuable because I'm not like my cousins um, or like my older brother. Um, I was in a school where we sang the Negro National Anthem every day. Um, and I went to school with black kids from every part um, of the class strata. Um, and our parents and our grandmas cobbled together money um, for us to go there and to see ourselves. And so I'm um, so thankful to Christopher for that beautiful introduction because what I'm trying to create with the June Jordan Fellowship is an opportunity um, to approximate that in some small way. Um, is if it's only for like two hours, you know, students get to do poetry with Christopher, right? They get to do playwriting with Zora, you know, Howard. Um, they get to learn photography from Raj and B. Walker, right? And for that moment, uh, they can't touch you. So this is Elegy for the Modern School. This much I can prove. We were black and unfinished in the Harlem of old a mass of naps and Vaseline knees before the promise of faster Wi-Fi and craft beer was code for what it's code for. Then my mother would drop us off in her 89 Toyota Camry, its cool steel flesh, the color of a half-dead rhododendron. And my big sister would hold on to my left hand, which fit in hers like a quarter's worth of peanut chews back then until the bell bid us scatter. I was a good boy and thus defined by a certain lust for solitude the countless ways I learned to scream, don't touch. This was all I knew of the world I had yet to name. Its utter indifference, its physical laws, my sister a kind of atmosphere, more God or feeling than another small, finite body like mine that could be known well or else destroyed. Miss Cherry owned a ruler as long as my daddy's entire forearm, this is a true story, called it Redeemer kept the instrument at the front of our classroom so as to enrich our already budding sense of the apocalyptic, would wrap our knuckles and backsides with it like a blacksmith in love with labor anytime we dared behave as if we were, in her words, outside our natural minds. Our parents thought this little more than rational extension of age-old wisdom when it comes to rearing the hunted. I cannot keep you alive but I will see you die at my hands long before the day I let the law erase your name from the ledger of the living. And so it was that in songs and parables long given to the tide of Reagan and concrete bleeding blackness all over and wayward shots meant for men themselves too young to know the scent of cells and aspiration rotted through, we learned how we arrived at the underside of modernity, children only while we were held and honed within those broad brick walls, a place for us to be unburied and yet unashamed, unassailable, unaware of an entire order, lingering like lions at the door. Thank you. All right. So my last pair. I'll close here with a poem from my dad. So again, just thinking about the ties between the carceral state and the American school, my father integrated his high school in Birmingham, Alabama. Right? It's surreal. <laughs> he also fought in the Vietnam War uh, right after. So I think, and he's a pacifist. So it's, it's interesting, like, at least he's, he's anti-war for sure. And it's always interesting for me to sort of sit with my dad, like, because on the one hand, he's like, kind of like a quiet dude. He's also this like history textbook in so many ways. And he's just really framed the way I think I think about my personal relationship to the state. And I'm so thankful that you use the, the phrase redistribution of resources. I really think that's what I'm at. Like, at its best, what a university can be is just a space where we can, I'm on camera, whatever. It can be a space where <laughs> we can take the resources we have here and give them away um, in all kinds of ways. That, that's not even just information. It's like even when classrooms are open on the weekends, those can be places for programming because we're in a community. 
right? And we owe something to the community that we're in and that we take up space in. And these are multi-billion dollar corporations um, that buy up land, that displace folks. And so I think it's incumbent upon us as ethical actors to give back as much as we can. I literally mean give back. I don't mean like community service. I mean give back what was stolen um, because we live on stolen land and we occupy stolen territory. Um, And reparation needs to be an everyday act for us, not just in language, but in practice in every way possible. So this is America will be. I wrote it almost a year ago to the date when I called my parents after uh, Trump had been elected. Um, And they said they were deeply saddened, but not surprised. Um, And it was time to get back to the work. It's really how my parents talk to me, which is telling, I guess, in some ways. But my mom doesn't play games. So this is America will be after Langston Hughes. I am now at the age where my father calls me brother when we say goodbye. Take care of yourself, brother, he whispers a half beat before we hang up the phone, and it is as if some great bridge has unfolded over the air between us. He is 68 years old. He was born in the throat of Jim Crow, Alabama, one of 10 children, their bodies side by side in the kitchen each morning like a pair of hands exalting. Over breakfast, I ask him to tell me the hardest thing about going to school back then, expecting some history I have already memorized. Boycotts and attack dogs, fire hoses, Bull Connor and his personal tank, candy paint shining white as a Confederate ghost. He says, honestly, having to read the Canterbury Tales. (laughs) He says, eating lunch alone. Nowadays, I hear the word America and think first of my father's loneliness. The hands holding the pens that stabbed him as he walked through the hallway, unclenched palms settling onto a wooden desk, taking notes, trying to pretend the shame didn't feel like an inheritance. You say, democracy. And I see the men holding documents that sent him off to war a year later. Motown blaring from a country boy's bunker as napalm scarred the sky into jigsaw patterns. His eyes open wide as the blooming blue heart of the light bulb in a Crown Heights basement where he and my mother will dance for the first time, their bodies swaying like rockets in the impossible dark. And yes, I know that this is more than likely not what you mean when you sing liberty, but it is the only kind I know or can readily claim. The times where those hunted by history are under ground and somehow daring to love what they cannot hold or fully fathom when the stranger is not a threat but the promise of a different ending. I woke up this morning and there were men on television lauding a wall big enough to box out an entire world. Families torn with the stroke of a pen, citizenship little more than some garment that can be stolen or reduced to cinder at a tyrant's whim. My father knows this, grew up knowing this, witnessed firsthand the fire bombs, the clan, multiple messiahs, love soaked and shot through, somehow still believes in this grand blood-stained experiment, still prays that his children might make a life unlike any he has ever seen. He looks at me like the promise of another cosmos. And I never know what to tell him. All of the books in my head have made me cynical and distant, but there's a choir in him that calls me forward. My disbelief, built as it is from the bricks of his belief, not in any America you might see on network news or hear heralded before the start of a football game, but in the quiet power of Sam Cooke singing that he was born by a river that remains unnamed, that he runs alongside to this day, some vast and future country, some nation within a nation, black as candor, loud as the sound of my father's unfettered laughter over cheese, eggs, and coffee, his eyes shut tight as armories, his fists finally unclenched as if he were invincible. Thank you. All right. Um, Next up, we have Joe McDonough. 
Uh, Joe is a recipient of the Lana, uh, Lannan NEA uh, Coleman Center slash uh, NYPL uh, fellowships, the Wallace Segner Fellowship. Her most recent books of po book of poems is Reaper from 2017. Um, other accolades, she taught incarcerated uh, college students through Boston University's prison education program for 13 years. She teaches in the MFA program at UMass Boston. Please welcome Jill. I wanted, I wanted to start with a, a poem that kind of reads, talks back to some of the ideas that I hope we address in the Q&A, these ideas of reparations um, and of innocence. Um, with a poem called I Dream We Try Gun. And this is based uh, on a, I had, I had this dream. I had a real dream. Um, and I wrote a poem about a real dream. And it was before we had an education secretary who said that we need uh, guns to be able to kill bears if they um, came into a classroom. So I, I was there first. I just wanted you to know. It was amazing. <laughs> I Dream We Try Gun. I dream we try gun manufacturers as terrorists and win. The gun industry is a team of sneering white guys, suits, saying all the wrong stuff. Am I a lawyer? Witness? I am Julia Roberts in Pelican Brief. And Aaron Brockovich. I say crossfire more than terrorism and school kids every day. Their lawyers smarmy, dismissive, saying Sandy Hook and of course those beautiful children. And I say no, the other ones, the ones you make us take for granted, the ones that you can't see. Black kids shot dead daily, whole zones we've given up. He smirks. What about cars? Cars kill people. Says bears, terrorists, sharks. But in the dream I'd said enough. Whatever I said worked. Everyone laughed at the gun guys, gun guys crying shark. We won, one instant reparation. Our dead spun back to before. Not like zombies, not like the monkey's paw, just back, all better, all gun deaths now undone. Dried blood gone bright, pulling back into her pink slacks, his black hoodie's holes now healed. At first, we're scared. It's not just kids, it's everyone. Good guys and bad. Soldiers from forever now come home. We get them all back to help with what next. And we know who the terrorists are. I want up. Um, so it, starting in 1998, I was in graduate school and I started teaching uh, in prisons in Massachusetts for a prison education program that was college. So I taught in prisons. I've also taught in Changing Lives Through Literature, which is um, people on probation. Um, and I also now am working in a, a, a juvenile, I call it kid jail, a, a juvenile facility. Um, and also I just started last week working in a jail. It's really hard to get educational initiatives going in jail because people have shorter sentences and um, they aren't as interested in providing programming. Um, but I, I wanted to talk about that, re that notion of redistribution because for so long, um, now I'm kind of taking my tenure. I have tenure now, which is pretty nice. Um, and using it as a, as a kind of money um, to, to do this kind of work. But before I had tenure, I was teaching at Harvard um, and teaching the same class at Harvard that I was teaching in the prison. And I would go into Harvard and there, and if you've ever taught at Harvard or maybe taken a class here, um, there are these really beautiful chalkboards that somebody washes for you and you don't ever get to see them do it. It's this invisible work that happens before you come in. And there are these beautiful um, lambskin covered huge erasers and fresh boxes of chalk every time and in the prison there are not these kinds of resources so I used to smuggle the chalk in um, I'd steal the chalk from Harvard and I would take it to the prison thank you um, and also stealing from the oh my god I had like a Kinko's card here and I was like a lot of copies everybody's getting copies in the prison we're all because um, you're only allowed to have one book at a time so I was like here's here's your book bam like that's that's your reader um, but in the prisons uh, they would hide the chalk for me in the in the ceiling tiles, um, along with whatever else they were keeping up there. But that wasn't my business. Um, one of the classes that I taught when I was in prison was African American history, which was an opportunity to have a 10,000-page reader. Um, 
And this, it's one of the first times that I started, and my first book is all sonnets about executions in American history. Um, and this poem was one of the first times that I started to think about how to write about the people that I was observing who were incarcerated to do those kinds of uh, um, observation poems. November 11th, 1831, Nat Turner, Jerusalem, Virginia. Of course, Turner's mind, restless, inquisitive, observant of everything, would turn his rage to visions of the spirit at work. He gives accounts in his confession of spirits engaged in battle, blood on the corn, and hieroglyphs on leaves that told him what to do. My class in the prison disagrees, has trouble with Nat Turner, with the visions, violent acts against children who never hurt him. Upset, one blurts out, I was tortured and abused by my boyfriend, then killed some other guy, and that ain't right. He's cold in the ground. What did he do to me? Next, we review what they did when he died. Flesh rendered to grease. A money purse made of his hide. Particular crimes. The man who burnt a city block the one who left a homeless vet for dead, the one who raped a grandmother for hours, they all turn in their tidy work on time. The Boston Globe on a stabbing, hacking, and 37 times. Sometimes I can't sleep at night, pull the shower curtain quick to catch whoever's hiding there off guard. When they meet Iago, they love him. He was justified. Justified? I shake my head, quote the play, write line numbers on the board. They all hold the book in one hand, gesture with the other like lawyers. They know lawyers, all in matching suits. They understand Iago and they want him to suffer. They laugh, discuss what torments will ope his lips. The coordinator approved my proposed text by saying, I don't think we have anyone who committed those particular crimes. Othello, Medea, beloved. Not one of my best students smothered his pale wife with a pillow, stabbed his small sons for revenge, slit his baby daughter's throat to keep her out of bondage. Not one of us will scatter the pieces of our brother in our wake. Alleged. I had a favorite student in the prison. He was my age, beautiful, sturdy, and enormous from lifting weights. He was doing great, working hard on his papers, had terrific things to say. Then he was gone. When I asked where he was, the other student said he'd been sent away for an alleged. I didn't understand, and they tried to explain. Sometimes we have to work together to figure out what's prison slang, what's legalese, what everybody knows, and alleged, you know, they say he did it. When I asked what he was alleged to have done, they said, exasperated, the alleged, what was I, retarded? I quit asking after we ran through this who's on first routine a couple times, went to the blackboard to diagram, not it was a great party, or this is a difficult class, but it was an alleged beating. I took a little time to outline allegation, allegiance, alleged. They nodded, into it now, taking notes. One said in an experimental tone, it was allegedly brutal. And I pointed at him with my chalk, said, yes, very good, and wrote it down. Women's prison every week. Lockers, metal detectors, steel doors, CO to CO, different forms, desks, mouth open, turn, so slow, I use the time to practice patience, grace tenderness for glassed-in guards. 
the rules recited as if they were the same rules every week. I can wear earrings. I cannot wear earrings. I can wear my hair up. I cannot wear my hair up. I dressed by rote, cords in blue or brown, gray turtleneck, black clogs. The prisoners, all in gray sweatshirts, blue jeans, joked I looked like them, fit in. I didn't think about it until I dreamed of being shuffled in and locked in there, hustled through the heavy doors. In the dream, the guards just shook their heads, smirked when I spelled out my name, shook the freezing bars. Instead of nightly escorts out, I'd stay in there forever. Who would know? So I went to Goodwill, spent 10 bucks on pink Angora, walked back down those halls, a movie star. When I stood at the front of the class, there rose a sharp collective sigh. The one who said she never heard of pandering until the arraignment said, okay, I'm going to tell her. Then she told me, freedom is wasted on women like me. They hate the dark cotton jeans they have to wear, each one a shadow of the other, their whole sentence. You could wear red, she accused. Their favorite dresses, silk slips, wool socks, all long gone, bagged up for sisters, moms, maybe Goodwill. Maybe I flicked past them looking for this cotton candy pink Angora cardigan, its pearl buttons. They can't stop staring, so I take it off and pass it around. Let each woman hold it in her arms, appraise the wool between her fingers. A familiar gesture, second nature from another world. Getting shot on your birthday. It was a memoir class. Read St. Augustine and write about youthful transgressions. Read David Sedaris, write something funny and sad. I was having trouble coming up with examples. Once I called home and a stranger answered. My boyfriend had moved out and sublet our place. They would have loved that story, the shiftless man and getting done wrong being favorite themes. But when you teach in prisons, you're warned not to talk too much about yourself. So I didn't say anything, just waited it out, sat on a table and swung my legs, smiled while they shook their heads and frowned. Finally, a woman I'll call Andrea said, you mean like the time I got shot on my birthday? And we all laughed and made the sympathetic sounds that mean poor Andrea. Andrea was delighted to have gotten something so right. I was so drunk, she told us. I didn't even know I'd been hit. Wrecked my new blouse, she added. While we're laughing so hard, we're in tears. I think I'll read me four more. This is your chance. English composition at South Middlesex Correctional Center. Julie reads out loud, and I praise her super thesis, then show her paragraphs, veer away from it. Just summarize. And is she pissed? Too pissed to listen when her classmates try to help. Amanda offers act two, scene one. Now I do love her too, as evidence of Iago's state of mind. But Julie's shutting down, frowning at her handwritten draft, writing that took her weeks. Hey, Julie, I say. Julie doesn't look up, says what? Says, I hate this stupid paper now. So I say, hey, Julie, Amanda's helping you. Write down what she's saying. She says, I'm aggravated. I think they take classes on naming their feelings. I say, I know it, but you need to pull it together or you'll end up screwing yourself. This is your chance. We're all quiet, breathing together, willing her to break out of this. Then, a little miracle. I look around the room and see that everyone is beautiful. Each did something special with her hair. Hey, I say again. I say hey a lot in prison. Hey, wait a minute. What's up with everybody's hair? Mabel got a haircut. 
Ellie's hair is long and black and gleaming down her back. Amanda's in French braids. Julie's freshly blonde, down to the roots. You guys all look great. They laugh. They're happy I noticed. Thank God I noticed. Now, for a minute, we are women in a room talking about their hair. Julie says Amanda did her highlights and Sandy blew it out. Good job, guys. She looks great. Then I say, Julie, look at you all pissed off over your paper when you're so lucky. Look at all these good friends you have helping with your paper, doing your hair. She nods. She looks me in the eye, back with us, back on track. I know, she says. I need to work on my gratitude. Where you live. In the waiting rooms of our prisons, women wait with well-dressed kids. The kids are cuter here somehow than anybody has a right to be. I get in first, but no one's angry. I look like a nice lady. I smile at the babies, carry books, but no briefcase. Don't wear a lawyer's suit. Going in to talk about Othello with rapists, murderers, con men, thieves, all men defined by what they did one time, now a long time ago. Prison, a place where people live. It might be nice to know your neighbors are reading Shakespeare instead of carving a shiv. Where you live, it's sunny. Where I live today, it's not. When Josie was offered that steak in the bar in LA, we were instant Los Angelenos in our minds. How quickly it happens. Elliot Spitzer behind bars in an instant. Cheney arrested in Spain. I think about that a lot. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Cheney goes to Spain and he gets arrested. He doesn't come back ever. <laughs> Cheney arrested in Spain. All of us imagining him there, our imagined house with its imagined Meyer lemon tree, the hard time we had parking our imaginary car. How then can anyone imagine it's so hard to change? The students in the prison, scholars as soon as they sign up, their children, poets as soon as they rhyme. I want to be a writer, people tell me. And I nod, me too, now right. Prisons, hospitals, schools, the great cities, their one-way streets and festivals, we put our bodies there together, upright and seated, walking along the hallways built to human scale, sitting in rooms designed around imagined hordes of you. Prison cell, cathedral, we imagined them, invented, built them around our bodies, or the bodies those spaces would hold. I'm going to end with two newer ones. Um, they're not long. Cindy comes to hear me read. Cindy, not her real name. I met her in prison, and people in prison I give the fake names. I taught her Shakespeare, remember her frown, wide eyes, terror of getting things wrong. Her clear, arguable thesis on Desdemona's motives, Desdemona's past. The last days were hard on her. It taking visible work to see things could be worse. Imagine, I did. But now she's out in jewelry and makeup, new clothes, haircut she chose and paid for. We hugged. We'd never hugged. It's not allowed. On the outside, you can hug whoever you want. She told me she has an apartment now, a window, an ocean view. She has a car, she told me, and we both cracked up. The thought of it wild, as far-fetched then as when you're a kid playing grown-up playing any kind of house. She has a job. She drives there in traffic. Every day she sees the angry people, sweet, silly people, mad, God bless them, at traffic, at other cars. She laughs, she told me, laughs out loud, alone in her car. People around her, angry as toddlers. Whole highways of traffic. Everybody at the work of being free.
spelling prostitutes. I volunteer at a juvie, call it kid jail. We play a homemade boggle, make all the words we can, make mad lib things with them like this. Lip split from slipping and shit, I sit and sip spilt spit. We write fast poems, rescues, give a lot of high fives. One kid loves fun facts. One, what would you do with five million dollars? But then just says he'd give it to foster kids. Fun facts wants to buy the building, a bulldozer, knock the whole fucking kid jail down. Good call. I make him write a shopping list, crowbar, hard hat, boots. <laughs> Say he could rent a wrecking ball. A third says he'd spend his on, how do you say it, prototute? He doesn't speak English so hot, doesn't know grown up, omit, prostitutes, I say, P-R-O-S, spelling it for him, cracking up until fun fact says, miss, that's because he was a prostitute. Some split seconds in kid jail I trip over, slip in my pocket to ponder later indulge my rage or tenderness. I want to bulldoze down the house where he was hurt, reset to spin him back into an unharmed toddler, pluck his plump self up and hide from what, from here, we know will happen. I want to beat a pimp to death with a crowbar, rent a wrecking ball, but we only have an hour or so an hour that's not about me or my precious, privileged, white, hot, lily, white heart. So I spell prostitute for a kid who was a prostitute. Or maybe not. Maybe none of these boys has ever been hurt. Maybe fun facts is fucking with me. I spell prostitute and say, oh man, you guys are so much more generous than me. I was going to buy a villa in Venice. Then they ask, what's a villa and where is Venice? And I draw Italy on typing paper, describe the Grand Canal and watery alleys, and floating up to column villas on long wooden boats, write gondola, canal, and Venice, say so they can visit my villa, bring all their foster kids, their prostitutes. Thank you. Jackie Wang is our final uh, presenter before we do uh, Q&A afterwards. No formal introduction again. So, well, okay, small formal. Um, <laughs> uh, Jackie's doing her doctorates right now um, at Harvard. Her book, uh, Carceral Capitalism, is coming out um, in 2018. Uh, January. Ooh, it's pre-order? Yes. Um, is pre-order up yet? Okay, so get your pre-order on. Um, Christina asked yesterday how Jackie and I had met, and I was like, oh, it was before Jackie was at Harvard, before I was at NYU, before either of us had really any publications or anything, and we were in a group of like four people in a queer commune an hour east of Memphis, like in the woods, um, like writing and talking poems together. And then now we're somehow here. Um, so yay, weird life, and I'm really glad that we get to like travel the world um, and the country and just experience um, everything together. Um, so welcome, Jackie. Holy crap, I'm so short that the microphone is um, miking my forehead. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, so um, thank you. Um, so I wanted to thank the Woodbury Poetry Room for having me. Um, the Poetry Room has been a refuge for me since I've been here. Um, I also wanted to thank my students who are here tonight. Um, I have the uh, honor of TAing for Cornell West this semester for his race and modernity class, so it's been an, a pleasure working with the students in the class. Um, and I also wanted to thank Jill, Joshua, and Christopher for reading with me, and I love your work, and it's so great to be sharing the stage with you all. 
Um, so um, um, this uh, excerpt that I'm reading from my book tonight um, is called The Prison Abolitionist Imagination. Um, and the essays in my book, Carceral Capitalism, are about prisons, police, and racial capitalism, um, but from the perspectives of political economy, uh, law, discourse, and police technology. Um, but I wanted to end with poetry, even though they're nonfiction essays, because I consider myself a, probably a poet before anything else. Um, and my editors were like, yeah, you can do that. You can just have poetry at the end of your nonfiction book. So I thought that was great because I've been incubating this project about the prison abolitionist imagination for some time. Um, so I came to study prisons um, because my older brother, um, when I was 16, was given a juvenile life without parole prison sentence. Um, he, in February, took a deal for 40 years, so he'll still be in prison for some time. So I've been thinking about prisons um, since I was a teenager. Um, and so I was thinking about how naturalized prisons have become. Um, and for me, poetry has the potential to undo the prison um, as a naturalized form that we think is necessary. Um, so this is, this is uh, from the prison abolitionist imagination. The late Mark Fisher once famously said that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. The same could be said about prisons. It is easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine a world without prisons. And yet the modern prison as it currently exists in the US is a fairly recent invention. Florida, which now has one of the largest prison systems in the US, had no physical penitentiaries at the end of the Civil War and had to create its penal system from scratch. Yet at this historical juncture, prisons have become thoroughly naturalized. Imagining and working towards a world without prisons, which is the project of prison abolition, would not only require us to fundamentally rethink the role of the state in society, but it would also require us to work towards the total transformation of all social relations. A project as lofty as this is easy to dismiss as unrealistic, utopian, impractical, naive, an unrealizable dream. But what if, instead of reacting to these charges with counter-arguments that persuasively demonstrate that the abolish abolitionist position is the only sensible position, we instead strategically use these charges um, as a point of departure to show how the prison itself is a problem for thought that can only be unthought using a mode of thinking that does not capitulate to the realism of the present. Can the re-enchantment of the world be an instrument that we use to shatter the realism of the prison. What follows is a series of questions, conversations with revolutionaries, dead and alive, on death, dreams, the struggle, and the phenomenological experience of freedom. There are moments I want to enter. Will you follow me there, to the place where the breathing walls Quietly exhale a low freedom song. One, a dozen roses versus the police state. In From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, Kianga Yamada Taylor writes, quote, in the hours after Mike Brown's body was finally moved, res residents erected a makeshift memorial of teddy bears and memorabilia on the spot where the police have had left his body. When the police arrived with a canine unit, one officer let a dog urinate on the memorial. Later, when Brown's mother, Leslie McSpadden, 
laid out rose petals in the form of his initials, a police cruiser whizzed by, crushing the memorial and scattering the flowers. The next evening, McSpadden and other friends and family went back to the memorial site and laid down a dozen roses. Again, a police cruiser came through and destroyed the flowers. Later that night, the uprising began." End quote. I think about how the people gathered after Mike Brown was killed, how they made a makeshift memorial on the blood-stained spot in the road where he had been murdered by the police state. What do I see in this encounter? The will of the people butting up against the police's desire to destroy, to crush all public expressions of grief. The police's show of force is unnecessary, compensatory. They want us to believe that the police cars will always crush rose petals. They tell themselves that their uniform and the power that backs it makes them invulnerable not like the rose petals arranged in the shape of MB. Erase the memorials, erase the flowers, the people will still rise up. That night, an uprising bloomed out of the ground where the memorial flowers had been crushed. I once read an article about the dreams of dying people. There was a former cop who couldn't stop having nightmares about the people he had violated. He told a hospice nurse that on the job he had done bad stuff. Tormented by his dreams, he gets stabbed, shot, or can't breathe. Eric Garner's last I can't breathe circles in time to haunt the officers who take the air out of the world. The cop died with so much regret. The conscious mind of the police officer may be sure of its correctness, but the unconscious mind knows it has done terrible things. The trampling of the memorial flowers is an act of repression, but what you tried to blot out and refuse to integrate returns with greater vigor. If ever I were to meet the officers, I would tell them, before you die, you will encounter the lives you took and violated. You, driving around in your steel-enclosed fantasy of invincibility, you who must desecrate memorials to prove to yourself you are strong, to hide this weakness of imagination, a police cruiser scattering rose petals. What was it you tried to crush there? Was it a way to blot out awareness of your own death? And yet every time you tried to destroy the memorial, the people returned with objects that bore the memory of Mike Brown. You tried to force the people of Ferguson to forget. The people returned with a will to carry the memory into the streets. Two, the prison is our shadow. In a hypothetical conversation with his jailer, Darwish, a Palestinian poet, writes, quote, you, not I, are the loser. He who lives on depriving others of light drowns in the darkness of his own shadow. You will never be free of me unless my freedom is generous to a fault. Then it would teach you peace and guide you home. You, not I, are afraid of what the cell is doing to me. You who guard my sleep, dream, and a delirium mind with signs. I have the vision and you have the tower. The heavy keychain and a gun trained on a ghost. I have sleepiness with its silky touch and essence. You have to stay up watching over me, lest sleepiness take the weapon from your hand before your eyes can see it. Dreaming is my profession, while yours is pointless eavesdropping on an unfriendly conversation between my freedom and me." End quote. The poet prisoner haunts the guard, who becomes a prisoner of his paranoia. The profession of the poet is dreaming. 
The profession of the jailer is to contain. The poet is the one who makes the light. The guard is the one who takes it. He who lives on depriving others of light drowns in the darkness of his own shadow. Will the ones who built the nightmare also drown in it? The prisoner knows the true meaning of freedom while the guard knows only how to police this freedom. What does the jailer give up when he becomes an instrument of the state? Does the jailer remember what it means to love, to grieve, to rub the muscles of freedom or borrow the bird's example? They cannot, cannot annihilate what we carry in our hearts and minds. This vision of an elsewhere or the memory of a bird, how many poets and revolutionaries discovered freedom in a cell? Three, entombed flowers. In 1917, the revolutionary Rosa Luxemburg wrote to her comrade Sophie Leibnick from prison, quote, yesterday I lay awake for a long time. I dreamed to myself about various things in the dark, how odd it is that I'm constantly in a joyful state of exaltation without any particular reason. I lie there quietly alone, wrapped in these many layered black veils of darkness, boredom, lack of freedom, and winter. And at the same time, my heart is racing with an incomprehensible, unfamiliar inner joy, as though I were walking across a flowering meadow in radiant sunshine. And all the while I'm searching within myself for some reason for this joy, I find nothing and must smile to myself again and laugh at myself. I believe that the secret is nothing other than life itself. And in the crunching of the damp sand beneath the slow, heavy steps of the sentries, a beautiful small song of life is being sung, if one only knows how to listen properly. At such moments, I think of you, and I would like so much to pass on this magical key to you, so that always and in all situations, you would be aware of the beautiful and the joyful, so that you too would live in a joyful euphoria, as though you were walking across a multicolored meadow." End quote. In the dark of the night, you traveled to a colorful meadow, and with your powerful imagination wove that meadow into a cloak of stars that you imparted to your comrade Sophie to wear as a shield against everything terrible. What bloomed in your mind that night as you lay quietly listening to the boots of the sentries crunching the sand? You are sharpening your perceptive faculties so you could tune in to the exalted frequency. You were sensitized by your cell, by the boredom weighing you down until the pressure of the darkness gave way to an understanding of the deepest mysteries of what it means to be alive, of the connection between desire and politics. I think of your fate, of George Jackson's fate, of Fred Hampton's fate. The state must know when the universe gives birth to a true revolutionary. It must see in them a light it must extinguish, lest their spark find and set free the divine spark in us all, which would spread until the world as we know it has been upended. Alone in your cell, your body became pure nerve, you were perceiving everything. It made you giddy, the inner joy you felt against the backdrop of the prison. I imagine how you passed the time there, studying political economy and botany, writing letters to your comrades, assembling your herbaria, preparing for the revolution, getting lost in the flowers of your imagination, you were the secret. You were the principle of life itself. You were a tree they had to cut down for the stars seen from prison. 
In September 1971, the prisoners of Attica rose up, took the prison, and carved out a small space of freedom, a temporary liberated zone from which they could observe the stars. Heather Ann Thompson, in a history of the Attica uprising, writes, quote, Despite the sense of foreboding, there were moments of levity, and for some, even a feeling of unexpected joy, as men who hadn't felt the fresh air of night for years reveled in this strange freedom. Out in the dark, music could be heard. Drums, a guitar, vibes, flute, sax, the brothers were playing. This was the lightest many of the men had felt since, the, since being processed into the maximum security facility. That night was, in fact, a deeply emotional time for all of them. Carlos Roche watched as tears of elation ran down the withered face of his friend, Owl, an old man who had been locked up for decades. You know, Owl said in wonderment, I haven't seen the stars in 22 years. As Clark later described this first night of the rebellion, while there was much trepidation about what might occur next, the men in D Yard also felt wonderful because no matter what happened later on, they couldn't take this night away from us." End quote. In the cracks of the prison, something bloomed. A field of wild flowers imposed on a night sky. Blood was coming. Joy and dread mingled there, infusing the air with a powerful sense of rapture and uncertainty. What exalted frequency was discovered that night, then lost, when Governor Nelson Rockefeller ordered the police to put down the uprising? blood was coming. The new world never arrived. How terrible it must have been for Du Bois to realize he had mistaken dusk for dawn, that darkness would follow and not the radiance of a new day, his people's strivings rendered crepuscular. The dream of liberation collapsed in a heap of bloodstained rubble. Blood was coming. The drumming would not last. The prisoners would be punished for daring to glimpse the stars. Will those who have constructed this hell ever wonder, what was it all for? The subordination of all life to these systems that hem us in, why cover the sky? Five, the dialectic of dreaming. Asada Shakur, a black revolutionary who lives in exile in Cuba, writes, Dreams and reality are opposites. Action synthesizes them. Before Asada Shakur was liberated from prison, her grandmother and family came to visit her, bearing a dream. You're coming home soon, her grandmother said. I don't know when it will be, but you're coming home. You're getting out of here. It won't be too long, though. She went on, I dreamed we were in our old house in Jamaica. I was dressing you, putting your clothes on. Asada's grandmother was known for her prophetic dreams. They came when they were needed, but it was ultimately the responsibility of the recipients of the visions to make them real, not only by believing in the veracity of the prophecies, but by acting so as to give them flesh. When Asada returned to her prison cell, she could not help but dance and sing. She writes, no amount of scientific, rational thinking could diminish the high that I felt. A tingly, giddy excitement had caught hold of me. I had gotten drunk on my family's arrogant, carefree optimism. I literally danced in my cell, singing, feet don't fail me now. I sang the feet part real low, so I guess the guards must have thought I was bugging out, stomping around my cage, singing, feet, feet. When we act in accordance with the prophetic dream, the dream comes to directly constitute reality. Six, the rhythm of revolt. Sometimes I don't know what to tell you or how to end. 
For some time, I have been thinking about how to convey the message of police and prison abolition to you, but I know that as a poet, it is not my job to win you over with a persuasive argument, <laughs> but to impart on you a vibrational experience that is capable of awakening your desire for a new world. A couple years ago, I saw the black arts movement poet and activist Sonia Sanchez speak. I was moved by the way she paused whenever she experienced vertigo and spontaneously started singing as a way to find her rhythm after nearly passing out. In a haiku, Sonia writes, without your residential breath, I lose my timing. Our bodies are not closed loops. We hold each other and keep each other in time by marching, singing, embracing, breathing. We synchronize our tempo so we can find a rhythm through which the urge to live can be expressed collectively. And in this way, we set the world in motion. In this way, poets become the timekeepers of the revolution. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for everyone's presentations. We're going to do a very quick 15-minute Q&A about all the aforementioned topics. Um, and then we'll go out into the hall, the night, the, yeah. OK, uh, the stars, yes. Um, so uh, we'll set up really quick, and then 15-minute Q&A. You want to turn the podium here? Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, they're so like generous and present, you know. Okay. Ooh, transition of microphones, wonderful. Like, um, <laughs> thanks for everyone in the room. Still, we'll get onto the Q and A. You can keep me accountable. I promise, fifteen minutes. Um, so, also. Um, some of the questions are posed at an individual uh, who is sitting to my left or your right. Uh, others, uh, feel free to chime in and let the conversation flow freely, naturally. Yeah. Um, so Jackie and I had worked together on the essay that I was reading from today. Some of the sections uh, discuss notions of violence and also constructions of humanity. Um, we'll start our Q&A there. Uh, Jackie, can you speak a bit more to the definitions of violence and innocence uh, according to the state? I'm thinking about your essay against innocence, where you define innocence as non-threatening to white civil society. OK, great. Well, I mean, I guess I should give them a little bit of um, backstory about the essay. Um, um, Loma is referring to an essay that I wrote titled Against Innocence, which is going to be in my book, which is um, a critique of the framework of innocence to, th to think about anti-racist um, activism and organizing. So what I was trying to um, unpack in the essay is why um, prisoners and so-called criminals and people who are deemed um, not respectable um, started to get left out of um, anti-racist organizing more and more. So the NAACP, 
initially included prisoners in the, in the we that they were speaking of and, and did organizing around prisons. Um, but in like the 80s and 90s, you see the discourse shifting dramatically and there's um, this pivot towards this law and order politics. And so I was basically um, showing how using innocence to make claims um, doesn't deconstruct the paradigm itself. So when you say, um, you know, Troy Davis should not be executed because he is innocent. There is also this Im implied um, indictment of the so-called uh, guilty subjects. Uh, but that, but in order um, to really have a, a politics that f challenges racism on a very fundamental level, um, I think you have to de deconstruct that framework and say, no, it's not like the good guys and bad guys. This whole system is a form of state violence. Um, so, so that was basically um, the essay that I wrote. And Loma picked up on that for the essay on poetry in the age of ma mass incarceration, and specifically by looking at uh, poets who were challenging this dichotomy between um, innocence and guilt. Um, yeah, do, 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 do either of you want to say anything about that? It, it makes me angry. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's a dumb, when, whenever people are like, oh, aren't you scared when you teach in the prison? And these, these ideas about um, people that suggest they aren't people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking too about Angela Davis's writing on and our prisons obsolete. And like part of this idea she's taking up is that almost all of us have committed criminal acts, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> in right. one way or another. So even this mm -hmm. idea of this sort of constructed vision of crime against which the people that are incarcerated are the ultimate transgressors is just a fundamental lie. We know police are very bad at catching murderers, for instance, right? And, and nonetheless, we move through civil society every day. So yeah, I think that dichotomy is a dangerous one. Um, and it's ultimately how so many folks decide who has the right to live mm -hmm. and the right to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the other um, um, point that I make in the essay is that that, that framework also fetishizes a, a form of uh, passivity that requires like passively suffered black victimhood um, in order to make its claim and to be legible as a legitimate claim. Mm -hmm. um, so I, on the political side, in, in terms of, of thinking about how to um, organize and um, construct our political discourse, that was another problem that I identified with the innocence paradigm, yeah. Um, so I'll use that as a kind of a, um, I'll use the conversation about innocence and criminality kind of to transition to Joshua and thinking about uh, humanity and uh, animality because a lot of the times uh, not innocence gets conflated with like otherness, non-human. Um, mm -hmm. So in an email from Jackie, um, I would love to, I would be interested in hearing about your analysis, critique, question mark of humanism and how it intersects with uh, the project of ab abolition. Che Gossett mentioned your work also engages with animal studies. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, oh, can I, can I ab elaborate on the question a little bit? <laughs> Hell yeah. Okay, because I was actually just thinking when I was uh, listening um, to you all read, I was remembering um, this thing that Ben Lerner talks about in a book that he published recently on um, contemporary poetry, and he says he said that when he was editing, uh, when he was a poetry editor, he received submissions uh, from prisoners, and they would say, you know, like this is a way for me to demonstrate my humanity. I write poetry from inside prison, and it was actually very meaningful for them to get recognition through publication. And so there's a, a brief meditation in his book on um, the relationship between poetry and humanity, and specifically using poetry to, to demonstrate 
um, humanity. So I would be interested in hearing about that because there's sure. there, are way, there are ways in which I'm critical of of that kind of uh, of like way of indexing um, humanity. But. Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so part of my interest in it, so I'm working on this uh, book project called uh, Being Property Once Myself, Blackness and the End of Man. And uh, part of how I actually start off the book is by talking about the slave narrative as uh, black humanity's sort of literary proof, right? Um, and that on the first page of Frederick Douglass's narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, he says, you know, the slave knows about as much about his history as a horse knows of theirs. Right, and it's this very strange sort of fraught proximity he creates between himself and this animal. Right, um, in Douglas's early abolitionist speeches, he's making all these cases for animals. Right, as these ethical actors, um, and that's born from labor. That's born from sleeping alongside oxen and horses in the field. And uh, nonetheless, in those sort of early speeches, people would come and they'd be furious. They would say, "I came to see a slave." Right, and you've brought this eloquent sort of being before me, right? Some of the first reviews of Phyllis Wheatley's early writing are, if she can write this way, why is she a slave? Right, so I think we do have this sort of uh, really violent tie, this idea that people that are enslaved or incarcerated have no interior lives, right, of which to speak. And if they did, then how could we keep them in cages? Um, and for me, I'm trying to trace that thread um, through the black aesthetic tradition to see how have black folks written about animals? Right. What ethical vision do they have uh, for these creatures to whom they have been compared historically? And I was super shocked is that it's, it's not sort of this triumphalist vision where it's, oh, I supersede the animal through my brilliance. It's actually saying, I want to cast my lot with the brutes and the corpses and the beasts. Mm -hmm. right. It's actually saying we need a different planetary vision in which humanity is not predicated upon uh, property relations, dominion, and destruction. Right. So, that, that's my vision, right? I'm, I'm interested in this idea of can we have a world without cages, without zoos, um, and without this kind of flattening um, that makes blackness the caesura between human life and animal life mm -hmm. in so many ways. And I think that the prison becomes the lived space where that's acted out. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how I'm trying to tie abolition to this other book project. Great. Great. Um, and then the last question that I'll post in uh, a panelist before opening it up to the audience very briefly is for Jill. Um, using that, I wanted to know about a bit more about like your uh, imagination. Can you speak to your experiences teaching incarcerated youth and what do you believe is the function or the potential of poetry in the age of mass incarceration uh, to enable action outside of the literary world? Hmm. You think like specifically for the juveniles or everybody? Um, in general. I, feel, I mean, I, I think it does, it does humanize. It does give people um, a kind of permission that they're not necessarily feeling when they're getting squelched every day in those environments. So giving people a way to feel like people, um, to be called by names instead of numbers, to think about places outside of, of the room, um, to imagine new worlds, gives, gives them a, a rest um, from the hard work of, of being subdued. Um, and so when you can give that, that person that rest, it's like, it's like giving somebody mouth to mouth. Like it's just like it brings them alive enough so that they can live their own life again instead of like being beaten down all the time. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. Um, okay, we have a few more minutes. We'll take maybe one or two questions from the audience before calling it a night. Uh, there's a mic that uh, can happen if someone wants to raise their hand. Okay. I have so many questions, and I'm trying to narrow it down to one. So <laughs> my question's going to be a little selfish as an editor, kind of in Ben Lerner's uh, position, uh -huh. uh, who uh, I do get submissions from prisoners. And um, I'm curious what any of your experiences are navigating making space as sort of an intersectionality thing, navigating making space for incarcerated voices um, who themselves have inflicted violence on um, demographics that are even more marginalized than, than themselves. And this is experience I've had where uh, poetry that I think is really brilliant and meaningful and humanizing, I come to find is written by someone who has you know, murdered his wife and children. And what do I do with that? And, and do I put that out into the world? And how do I navigate that? navigate that as an editor, but how do you navigate that for yourselves 
and, I, and I'm not talking about forgiveness, that's a whole other thing, but just sort of navigating, making space for that in a sort of an aesthetic and human way. But how do, how do you navigate Ezra Pound? Like there's, there's a way that like there are a lot of people who have been published that um, we kind of take for granted. Yeah, I'm sure you would. It's good, good. That, that's a good start. Anyway, that was just what I thought yeah. I would throw that out there. But you... I mean, I think it's a, an incredibly complicated issue that really needs to be considered case by case, because this also raises questions about redemption. I don't like this word. I don't like the word reformation either. Um, but I, I have, I had a friend, um, she's publishing an essay in Lies, Volume 3, about working um, for an anarchist collective in Baltimore and being uh, basically the collective was friends with this guy who was incarcerated, who was publishing from prison. And when he got out, um, he was living, he lived in my friend's basement because he needed a place to live when he got out of prison. And he actually ended up raping someone in her uh, in her sp space. So this was she was actually infuriated that she wasn't given the full information about this person who was because like the cops came and broke down the door and raided the place and everything. Um, so I I think that yeah it's super complicated and there's not really you know one blanket moral answer that you can give to this yeah, yeah that's more so. interested in like what your personal experiences are navigating it not yeah you know, a prescriptive I mean, thing yeah. yeah I mean so for me my first experience is teaching period weren't in a university classroom they were in a prison um, I started a program when I was an undergraduate at Penn called the Prison Poetry Initiative where we would take creative writers and we would go into PICC in Riverside uh, on the weekends. And I don't know. I mean, I think in those first few sessions, my students self-identified as people that killed people and assaulted people and stole from people. And at that moment, I had to wrestle with the ethical question of, do these people have a right to create work? And it was a yes for me. I, I mean, I think for me, one, I just am not a moral exemplar that can adjudicate who has the right to have their work enter the public sphere. Um, I think that's one thing. And I think secondly, there are folks working through stuff and, and trying to think things through. And I think if we can make more space for the writing, I think that absolutely behooves us. And I think we benefit from that um, as, as long as we can expand the landscape and in any way we can. I think we should do that. I think that has to be the practice of the abolitionist imagination is to say no matter what sort of your your past, the archive of wrongs and how expansive it is, I think you should have the right to be able to create work um, and have it out in the world, it's even and especially if you can't be, um, if your words are sort of, sort of the only extension into the, the outside, then I think we have to facilitate that as editors. Um, and as an educator, I count that as my highest calling. Right. Great, we'll Great. take one more question and then we'll call it a night. Um, I'm, this isn't gonna be the most eloquent, cause <laughs> no, it has got me thinking about a lot of friends that are dead or either treated like they're dead. Um, so I'll try and get through the backstory so I get to the actual question, but you guys are all in academia, so that's the, the end of this. But so I don't look or sound like it, but I spent a lot of time in, in like middle and high school hanging out in the hood because I was doing drugs and you don't like think about class or race when you're doing drugs. You just kind of think about drugs. So I was chilling with other people thinking about drugs. Um, and I, I went from that situation, took a couple of years to like get my head together to be able to go to college, and then ended up in this space where it's just like a lot of people thinking of real, you know, who are for the most part genuinely invested in like sorting through things um, and, and working out how to be better people. Um, but a lot of the focus in academia ends up being on just saying the right things a lot. And I, um, and I still don't have the patience for it with a lot of the friends that I made in college um, because I, I just get too bitter and <laughs> Um, just like yell at people for just, uh, you know, people don't take it very well when you tell them they're not suffering because everyone is on some level, but going to college friends being like, you're spending way too much time in the head games of how to say this exactly right instead of being engaged and 
you know, embodying what you're talking about. Um, I, I still don't know to how to talk to my friends in academia about how to how to implement that in their actual lives without sounding like a dick. Um, how do you do that? Oh, I sound like a dick. Yeah. Like, I just go with that. Like, I, I sound like a dick all the time. I say the wrong thing over and over and over again, and I, then I apologize and I try to do better. What do you guys do? Like, me personally? I mean, well, one of my students, uh, so one of the myths of whiteness is invincibility, another is immortality, and another is the idea you don't have a story. So I think especially with, with my students, that come from backgrounds, whether they're wealthy or they've just never been sort of asked to uh, narrativize their own life or think about themselves as having a body, I just remind them that they do um, and that your contribution is not always about precision. I mean, I hear part of what I hear you struggling with is how do we make sure it's not just all language games and theory that never lands here, right? And I think what, what grounds that for me is that it can never be about that or I'm wasting my time. Right, because we're not immortal. There are stakes, and I think if the writing doesn't have stakes and it doesn't have blood in it, you've literally wasted everyone's time. And so part of how I try to do it is remember that I come from some place, and I come from some people, um, and they risked a lot for me to be here, and all that I can ever do is sort of empty out and pass along any good that I come across. Um, remember that you come from somewhere, and for your friends and colleagues, remind them that they come from somewhere, and they owe something to those people, they owe something to the earth, and they owe something to themselves. Um, to not be a part of the, the terrible mechanisms that create that destruction you're talking about, that violence, that is the diegetic music of places like here and other institutions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the pressure to be sanitized in institutional settings is so intense. I mean, just like your comportment, the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you interact with people, what is considered valid knowledge is experiential, experiential knowledge not valid. Mm -hmm. It's like you're being, you know, put through the meat grinder, I always say, and turned into a sausage, a professional sausage. Um, <laughs> and it's like you really got to fortify yourself in order to, to, to just like be who you are and not have your particular style, way of talking, way of interacting just completely homogenized. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, I, you know, like, I don't really spend all of my time in, you know, the Harvard space. My friends are mostly <laughs> outside of academia, so I don't really, I mean, I probably have internalized it over the years, but it is like a really, really intense pressure that is operating all the time. But I mean, like we met on the commune in, in Tennessee and where, you know, you do like nail art divination and BDSM and you're just with a bunch of like Weirdos. weird people. So you just gotta like maintain contact yeah. with that, you know. I don't know. That's the best uh, I can do. Yep. Thank you everyone in the audience. Thank you again thank to our you. panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. You're the best. And we did it. <laughs>